welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 168, featuring the third and final part of my interview with Mr. Sandy Peterson. In this part, we finally get around to his time at id, and he tells us all about his philosophy of great level design. It's really good stuff. I know you guys are going to enjoy that. Then we get into his time at Ensemble, and what he thinks about the state of the gaming industry, and what it takes to get a good job in it. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Sandy Peterson. Uh, well... At some point during all this, you played a Wolfenstein 3D, I assume. So, I was just wondering, when did you first see this game, and uh, what did you think? What was your sort of initial reactions to it? Never seen anything like it. I, it's like, wow! It's like it's 3D. The shooter aspect, the fact that they were smart enough to have Hitler be the final boss, you know, as it as how it really should be in every World War II game, right? And uh, so, I, I loved all those aspects. The, the fact that there was like each room was like a little tactical puzzle. In a sense, you walk into it and see there's there is the Nazis. How am I going to kill them? You know, don't wake up the dog, that kind of thing. So I was really, really impressed by that by that game. And then, like a year later, I was working for them. But Microprose, because of numerous mistakes on management's part, started shedding personnel. And of course, eventually, it stopped being an entity, right? But uh, it got bought out. But uh, I was one of the people that was shed. And um, a friend of mine knew the people at ID, and. Uh, I got a job interview that took me on for a month on spec to see if I uh, would work out. And apparently I did. So then I was there for five years. And uh, I was really excited to do Doom. And one of the moments of my life was when, just before Doom was released, I got to travel back to my old company in, in Maryland. And so I showed them what I was working on. I said, look, we're doing this. And they were just blown away. Like, they kept repeating. I remember Arnold kept saying, we would never be allowed to do something like this here. Never, never. You know, because it was gory and it was violent and it had all this stuff, and they were all really, really impressed. And I heard, learned later on that, that uh, some of the players started playing that game so much that they, like projects at Microprose were delayed by up to six months. So I took a little shade and Floyd out of that. I was wondering what your interview process was like and uh, just what the what you thought of the kind of wild atmosphere there. And it? Yeah. Well. It, I came in and they talked, and they took me to dinner and they talked a little bit. And what happened is, is at dinner we started talking about games, and John Romero said later for the first time he'd met someone who knew as much or more about games than he did, and so that really impressed him. Uh, John Carmack is of course always really hard to read. He's like the man from Mars that doesn't understand human emotions, and uh, so so he was like whatever you guys say. And the artists were pumping for me pretty hard because they really wanted to have a designer instead of a an artist doing the levels. Maybe because they didn't want to do the levels, I don't know. So then when I when they tried me out for a week and they liked my levels, and actually the level I did during that week is still in the game. Um, and it's level M, episode three, level six, I think. But uh, so then, uh, then I came on for a month of probation to give me more. They didn't really so much interviews as take me out and talk, me, talk about games. I mean, it weren't, they weren't like this tight run professional company where guys wore suits, you know, it was the kind of company where when John Romero got, uh, got locked in his, in his office, uh, John Carmack took an ax. He bought at Scarborough fair and hacked through the door to get him out. So they didn't call a locksmith. They chopped the door down with an ax. Okay. So I have a question here from one of my viewers named Saxon Bell. He wants to know uh, what were some of the your uh, what were some of the core ideas and concepts uh, that you had when designing levels for Doom. Okay, well, some of the core ideas I had. Let's here's, here's a few of them, Saxon. Well, number one was that I wanted every single secret in the level to have a hint to it. Nothing would there'd be something there'd be like a shadow on a wall or uh, or lights flickering or some other thing. In one level, the secret was that if you looked up in the, on the mini map, there was an arrow pointed at the door <laughs> in the mini map. So I did. Sometimes it was not real obvious, but there was always something. That's one of the principles. Another principle was that I didn't want the player ever to be to like. I wanted to build up suspense. So like my signature thing was doing something like putting a. Shot a, a rocket launcher on top of a pillar in the middle of the room with with, shot, with spotlights on it. So the player looks at that and he knows as soon as he picks that up, monsters are going to come. It's not a surprise. They're just teleporting out of nowhere. He says, okay, this is going to unleash all hell, but I want to have that rocket launcher. So he'd go get it, right? So that was one of my other principles. I like to, um, 
I, I kind of followed along. I tried to use the same principles as a, as a good horror movie. Where there's like part was yet, and then suddenly there's monsters. And I didn't mind having there be overwhelming numbers of the monsters if I had to use them. Um, I, early on, I wanted to have outdoor levels. I was one of the first guys to go outdoors with Doom. And make, I mean, Doom is like maybe not the world's greatest system to have in an outdoor zone, but that was my goal: is to have it seem like this is a big open area. I also liked little um, because of the way I think, which is, is in Call of Cthulhu, is to have. Like the uh, the little vignettes, the little scenes that are cool. I want I a lot of my levels are they don't necessarily have a strong theme, but they have lots of the little scenes where you go through where there's there's this ambush and there's this little puzzle and there's this problem. You go to room to room. Sometimes I try to get that out of my system, like in uh, Doom Two with the level tricks and traps. It's just like you start in that room, eight, a hexa octagonal room with eight doors around, it, and each door is a separate little trap. And so I just like okay, now I can think like a regular guy and make a theme. But... I just try to make themes of uh, how things look, but, you know, I'm not really much of an artist. My levels, I think, were generally uglier than the other play people, but I think they were fun to play, so. Do you have a favorite level of all time? A favorite Doom level of all time that I did or, that, or any Doom? For sure. Uh, well, yeah, one of yours or uh, that somebody else did. I think one of the levels I was the very most proud of was the secret level in Episode 2 of Doom where we just learned... And get the, remember, like almost everything in Doom was so we didn't know that monsters would would fight other monsters when they were hit by them that they would turn on the, their own kind that just came out of the way the code worked. So um, the secret episode of Doom Two is the one where there's two you, oh start in the room and you're surrounded by like or four or huge number of, of hell barons. And it's, it's completely, you can't possibly defeat them. It's, it's hopeless, right? But if you run into the next room where there's 10 cacodemons, you can get them to fight each other. And they pretty much fight each other almost to extinction. You can pull it off. So it's kind of like, it's it's like a one-trick pony, but I was always very proud of when I when I ran that in playtest. For the first, like, 18 times people played it, they would just sit there and cursing my name and saying, I sucked, and no one can ever beat this. Then they figured it out. Then it was easy from then on. So that was kind of a, I was like that. So... I interviewed uh, John Romero. It's been uh, quite a while uh, back, but I remember one of the things that he talked about was how disappointed he was with Quake. Uh, most specifically, he uh, didn't like the weapons. And I noticed that you had said that you uh, would have liked to have seen some more stuff in, uh, in Quake too, a uh, Quake power. So just wondering, uh, what would you have done? Or what did you want to see in Quake that wasn't there? I think that I would have liked to see more things like maybe being able to reflect lightning bolts. Uh, the, the nail gun just seemed like out of level. I guess it was because they had nine inch nails doing the music, right? So they Trent Reznor, so they wanted to use the nail gun. Um, I would like to see more melee or magical weapons. You know, one of the weapons we usually talked about having, for example, was a hammer that you'd hit the ground with and it would make this actual quake, hence the name of the game, which otherwise makes no sense, which would extend away from the hammer along the ground with puffs of dust and would heavily damage or knock monsters monsters back. And possibly even like damage walls. Of course that went away, you know, is that you can't damage walls, but at least go through doors. And, uh, and, and you know, of course it would be an interesting tactical thing because obviously flying monsters won't be affected by it, but the things you do, we, uh, you know, we talk about rocket packs or jump packs. Really the only, the, the, the coolest weapon in the game I think is the grenade launcher because you can arc it around and bounce things off. And that was, we thought that was pretty fun. But uh, it seems like, to a large extent, we just kind of did Doom again. Like, the early part was supposed to be a fantasy world, where we'd have swords and balls and chains and things like that. So one of the ideas was, like, this, this, this whirling thing, like a ball on a chain, except it was a cubicle. And you'd spin it around your head on this long chain, and as it orbited, when it hit monsters, it would, it would pop them, right? But you had to kind of time when it would be there, so it was like this logical thing, and... And the monsters would be all fantasy monsters mixed with technology. And the only thing that remained of that really was the ogres. Because they were ogres, but they had a bag of hand grenades. You know, so. So were you part of all this drama with uh, Romero at the time? Or are you trying to steer clear of it? It was pretty much a nest of drama queens at the time. I'll just say that. So I tried to be out of it as much as I could, but it's hard. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh <laughs> But anyway, you ended up at a, an ensemble after that, and I've had a Janelle Jaquays on, and I uh, just interviewed Graham yeah, uh, Devine. I was the one that got him hired at ID to replace me, 
and then I got him hired at Ensemble, not to replace me there, but just got, so I so two of his last uh, last few jobs were, were my doing. So because I'd known uh, Paul, well, when he was Paul back in the day, in uh, when I was leaving uh, Chaosium to go seek job in the game industry, I actually interviewed with then Paul at uh, Coleco for a job as a game designer, and he didn't hire me, which I've never let him forget. But uh, I was in the in the long run, as he pointed out, it was good I wasn't hired because. Six months after that, they closed down the whole department. Coleco released the Atom computer, and it was, you know, a catastrophic failure. So, well, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what it was like at Ensemble, and, and, and was it different than, uh, well, obviously, <laughs> quite different than ID, right? Yeah. Ensemble was um, was my favorite place to ever have worked. Ensemble Studios was very much a band of brothers where everyone was was really friendly, kind of the principle we use when hiring people. And this was, like, uh, I, I, I set out straight by, uh, um, by, by uh, one, of my, one of my friends there. He says, the principle is that if you're trapped in an elevator with someone else from Ensemble for a couple hours, you'll have something interesting to talk about no matter who it is. And that was kind of our design hiring strategy. Um, we, we tried to, we, we worked really hard on people not having... Um, uh, vested ego clashes and trying to work together as much as we could, respecting people and doing things the right way, you know, and it wasn't so much on, the, sometimes it was kind of weak, like um, often uh, the goal was to have everyone on the team be in agreement on some feature and that doesn't always work because then you have a very vanilla down feature. So sometimes the person, we had to have what we called our hill to die on where someone would say, okay, this is my hill. We're going to have this in the game, and that's my, and everyone had one of those they could pull off, and that helped uh, keep the game stronger. Uh, Ensemble's other weaknesses were that we took forever to do a game. Part of that was that our design process was to get an early version of the game out as soon as possible, and then just play test the heck out of it for like a year and a half or two years. So that we, and the goal there was we knew the game was fun, when it would be released, but getting that an early version that was playable often slowed production. But the good thing was we always knew it would be fun. So because our games cost so much to release and took so much time, every game had to be a big hit. And uh, I think we pulled that off. They were all big hits. But it was, you know, kind of scary sometimes. So what were some of your hills, Sandy? <laughs> well, um... One of my heels was uh, having the Aztecs in uh, the Conquerors. I said, I really, really want to have the Aztecs, and I know it's going to require us doing a whole new set of buildings and all this stuff, but that's, that's one, that was one of my heels. They're going to be in. I love the Aztecs. And, and of course, by having the Aztecs, then we already had the building, so I could just add the Mayans for free, you know, so there was that. Um, Actually, for me, I mean, since I was often the lead designer on the projects, I didn't have to worry about the hills so much. Everyone else was putting in their own hills that I had to walk over, right? Because I got the, I had kind of the whole thing going for me. And because I'm, uh, I'm naturally a very negotiating, affable kind of guy, I would, uh, I would be doing a lot of sales pitches. So, like, if I want to do a new, a new game project, first I would go to the, uh, to the team and say, hey, what do you think of this awesome idea? And they'd go, yeah, we love this. Or I'd talk them into it if they didn't. And then I would go to the to the other leads and say, hey, the team all loves this. What do you say? And they say, well, if the team loves it, we love it too. Then I have then I have the other leads. I go to management and say, the team and the and the leads all love this. What do you think? And they say, well, the team loves it. So I kind of I kind of did a bottom up technique of getting my way instead of going to being Zeus on Olympia and saying, you must do what I want because I am, you know, Peter Molyneux and everyone has to obey me. <laughs> but I was thinking about what you had said earlier about how you uh, would do a sort of early version of the game and then play test the hell out of it. And I was, uh, I've been watching a lot of these making of the classic albums on uh, Netflix. And uh, just so happens the one about, I watched one about Deep Purple, who is a, a bass player just uh, passed away, or piano, I'm sorry, yeah, piano player just passed away. But anyway, they were saying the same thing about how they would, uh, instead of just writing songs in the studio, they would sort of jam, you know, at the, at the concerts and the songs would come together that way over years, you know. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, as the team sizes are getting bigger and bigger and sort of game uh, studios are getting more and more, uh, you know, spread out and, and complicated, do you see games quality going up or going down or does it make no difference? Well, there's always... 
I think it's been this case ever since the early 90s is that there's a tendency for team size to get bigger in the big companies. And then at a, at a point, the games get so big and hard to put together that small companies come along and start doing little games. And these start moving up, you know, so you, keep, you, you have these big teams getting bigger and bigger, more impressive first-person shooters, for example. And then some stall team comes along and, and comes along and does uh, Serious Sam, right? Some little tiny company from Croatia says, look, we're going to have this game. Uh, or like now we have we have the giant companies trying to do their huge, massive uh, games. And yet on the iPhone, for instance, you have little tiny teams coming together and doing Angry Birds and uh, and these and these smaller games that, that are often big hits. So I think there's like there's this, this constant life cycle of companies tend to get bigger, but then the small companies come in and kind of do better on a, on a budget, and then they get bigger, and then other small companies come in. It's sort of like the principle where Hollywood tries to have every every movie be this giant, huge blockbuster that costs hundreds of millions to make. And then they actually don't make profits, even though they make hundreds of millions, because it costs so much to advertise and plug the game, the movie. So then when someone comes along with a small, uh, independent movie that, you know, only costs them a million bucks to make and makes them 20 million, it's like, look, our, our returns on our, our thing is 95%. You know, the return of Avengers is like 50%. So I think you have the same effect in the game industry. And as far as games getting better, I mean, do you think they're getting better? <laughs> well, I think you're, you're, you know, I made the same observation about how the, a lot of the most creative, innovative games aren't coming from uh, Activision. You know, they're coming from small, these small uh, teams, uh, Legend of Grimrock, for example. Yeah, well, it was the small team when it made... Uh, made doom right and then uh, here's here's a good example of how this happens id software comes together they make doom and it was a big hit we loved it and we said well let's do doom 2 we'll work on the next engine and then we said okay our next game is going to be a flight sim. i kid you not that was the plan from id software we're going to do a flight sim it was going to be like a, a comedy flight sim where the plane is all bristling with guns and you can blow up everything in the side so you'd be flying over the landscape and blow everything up okay but what happened is that our our first person shooters were so successful and made so much money that we never were able to escape that, and we just and they just kept doing first person shooters again. And so I spent you know, I spent all my five years there doing first person shooters. And of course, everyone there has done nothing but first person shooters, right? Because they can't they can't evade it. There was an attempt to make Quake more of a role playing game. Occasionally, there was still talk of doing the flight sim, but it went away. And so they got trapped in their rut. They weren't able to step back and say, "Hey, let's try something new." You know, so I every time I see a company that actually does that. Ensemble Studio was constantly trying to do that. You know, we, we'd made uh, Age of Empires, and it was a huge hit, and we said, okay, now we want to make a different kind of game. We'll do a fantasy-based game. And I was in charge of doing the fantasy-based game. That was, that's what I was hired for, was to make a fantasy RTS, and spell-based. And uh, lo and behold, they took every single person off my team by the end, you know, bit by bit over months, to work on, to finish up Age of Empires. So I said, you know, there's only me left on my team, so maybe I shouldn't do this. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then uh, they always wanted to do other games, but they never. We, when they finally got around to it, they finally had enough money in the bank set up we could afford to sit back and do our new thing. It was going to be a huge, massively multiplayer online game. And then uh, Microsoft uh, decided they were better off without a company that had never sold less than a million copies of every game they made. I don't think that was Microsoft Microsoft shareholder value, but that's what they did. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tragedy, I think, for not just for you guys, but for gamers. Yes. Well, it's not as big a tragedy for gamers as it, as it might seem, because what happened is that Robot Entertainment got formed, uh, Bonfire got formed, Words with Friends. The people at, at Ensemble didn't just, like, quit the industry. They were still all out there, and now there's, like, four or five companies. There's me at Barking Lizards, right? Four or five companies all doing games. So there might actually be more good games as a result. But, of course, it's not, it was fun to work with those guys, and I miss them. But I'm just kind of curious. Uh, you know, it seems like, you, you know, every, almost every uh, big budget game that comes out now is either a first-person or a third-person uh, shooter. I'm just wondering, back when you were working on Doom, did you imagine that this would be the, the case all these years later? No. We were so clueless on Doom that when we included the code to, um, to go head-to-head and, and shoot other guys, player versus player, we thought that, like, you know, 1% of the people maybe would do that, maybe less. We just put it in because we had it there, and we kind of liked it. 
no idea that it would be that it would become the driving mechanism for a whole generation of games. We didn't realize what we were doing. I I started. I got a little hint of of how big a deal was we were doing when I took it back to once to uh, Microprose with me, and everyone was immediately super hooked by the game because we knew the game was really fun. But we did not realize was that everyone would want to play head to head, and that that would start dominating the game. All those were were news to us. So we really didn't know what a tiger we had by the tail. Well, Sandy, I got a great a question uh, here for you. This is uh, one of your, based on one of your quotations uh, that I saw in an earlier. I don't remember if this was an interview or one of your uh, commentaries, but anyway, you said, you're not a real man, nor can you be a real artist, unless you have had failures as well as successes. So I'm wondering, uh, what do you consider to be your most valuable uh, failures? I would say that the Darklands Death March was a great learning experience for me. Watching all the ways that team went bad was really useful, you know, to me in later years and seeing, trying to get consensus on the team and making sure people work for it. Uh, seeing the top-down... Really, Micropose is a source of many of these things because it was so mismanaged, but seeing the way that, that the management would come down like, you know, like God and say, you must do X, you know, was really useful to see how badly that worked and hurt often hurt games um because so that was good uh it, it was i would say that um some of the things i learned was that it's okay to kill your children that if you have some some baby something on a game that's really awesome that you really like isn't quite working in it's a great idea sometimes to just go ahead and take that and dump it um uh other failures there's uh Well, there's the great failure of our MMO uh, ensemble, which was going along and looking good, and, and our conservative essence were making a billion dollars, and yet we weren't spending enough time, sadly, and this is, you know, there wasn't enough corporate, and I hate this fact, but there wasn't, we'd always had kind of a hostile relationship with Microsoft, even though they bought us. They were kind of jealous of our success. They wanted the other companies to do well, and they would, uh, instead of just us, and, they, and so they he didn't give us proper credit, and so those bad relationships eventually came to fruit when they said, we've got to cut the game, the Microsoft Game Studios, and instead of cutting companies that had done games that sold poorly, they sold the ensemble whose games had done well, but, you know, there you are. So, I guess you have to keep, so I learned to have someone to do that. I can't be that guy. I can't go suck up to the corporate bosses, but there has to be someone that can do that. So, those are the things I learned. As a, a former teacher of game design, I was just uh, wondering, do you have a, a canon of games that you think every aspiring game designer should be intimate with? Um, no, is the short word. I think that aspiring game designers need to play a lot of different games. They need to play old games as well as new games. One of the things that we would do is take original Zelda, for example, and we would dissect it and say, let's look at every single detail of how this game works. How do all the items work? How do the weapons work? How do the monsters work? What do you do physically when you're fighting the monster? What you physically do, of course, is you dodge the monsters, go to their side, and hit the A button. I said, that's the fun part of the game. Think about that. And I, I tried to get him to break it, you know, to try, try to describe a game in terms of not, I'm shooting monsters, but I'm moving sideways on the controller and hitting the A button. You know, so they think about it in the most basic possible level. Um, I made them play board games. So in card games, so they'd see different approaches to problems. I'd try to give them lots of examples of failures in games that were almost successes. Because sometimes, like, there's games which were really good and had interesting features but didn't quite make it that, uh, that deserved more look. One of the problems that game companies had, and it had a super severe case of that back in the 90, early 90s, I don't know what they're like now, but was, was the not invented here syndrome where every other company was stupid and only our things mattered. And so that's a tendency of any good company that people will tend to start thinking that way. It's, oh yeah, only we're the best, no one else matters. Ensemble tried really hard to keep that from happening, but of course it still did. So we would, so I would do things, I, I would review games by, like Sacrifice, I don't know if you remember that game. Sacrifice was a really interesting RTS game with a very unique system that was ultimately a failure in the marketplace. But I said, don't look at the reasons it failed, look at the reasons that it worked, you know, and, and try, to, try to see what we can draw from that. So I would always, always, always constantly be plugging up these, uh, 
small games. Romero, to his credit, did that at at id too. You know, when he we would play new games that came along and said, "Check this out. This is an awesome game. We should we should steal this idea." Because I think that no person can do it all themselves. You can't come up with every single idea in gaming by yourself. You have to have this this library of of concepts in your in your experience that you can draw on. So you know you have to you know you've played you know Mario sixty four and you've played uh, Warcraft and you've played uh, you know Eve Online or whatever it is and and every and no, since no one can play all the games there's just too many as long as you have a selection you've played you're familiar with you can do things like I could like I said I've stolen ideas from Captain Blood you know I think it was Captain Blood actually come to think of it but there's an obscure game I mean how many people have played that you know, yet ideas for that. I played the hell out of it I. <laughs> I love well, it. there you are. You're one of the few, you know. But you can look at it. You can say, "What can I take out of this game? That's good," um, you know. So, yeah. Speaking of some of the old Amiga stuff, I, I interviewed John here a while back. I don't know if actually last year. I don't know if you know him or not, but uh, he brought up a really interesting point about game design. And he was uh, saying, you know, you look at musicians like Bob Dylan. Uh, Rolling Stones, any of these people, and their old albums still earn lots of royalties for them. You know, whereas it doesn't matter how great your game is, it's only going to be viable for a couple of years, and then it you know stops making money. So how does you know? And something else interesting. I I guess that doesn't really happen so much with the paper-based games. Yeah, right? they're fleet, yeah. right? They're just still there. Uh, well, it, some games it does more than it affects more than others. For example, one of the things that help Ensemble Studios be so strong is that. RTS games have a really long afterlife, so that by the time we were doing Age 3, we were still selling a couple hundred copies of Age 1 every month, and that was just like free money at that point. You know, oh look, a couple $2,000 from Age 1, awesome. And Age 2 was still selling in the thousands. So, so whereas shooters tend to have a very short life. Once the next shooter comes out, the old shooter is like in the, in the bargain bin. Um, so some games have more than others. MMOs, of course, have quite a long life span. They go on forever. Um, so it kind of depends on the genre you're talking about, I think, but there is that kind of, you don't, you know, you, you don't get to survive off your, you don't have royalties off your old books like you do if you're an author or off your old games. You pretty much have to like hope that you're, you're only as good as your last picture, right? Like they say in Hollywood. So my last game is making me money and the one before that isn't making me any or it's, you know, so it's, a, it's actually a pretty harsh environment to develop in compared to other forms of art. That's what I've, you know, I've wondered about, whether you know, game designers think, well, I just need to, this just has to be successful for two years, you know, versus an author who wants to make the book that's still going to be selling copies uh, you know, for his, grand, his or her grandkids. Yeah. Well, what we, ha what we have as game designers is we know that this game is not going to be successful for more than two years, but if it's a hit, then it establishes an IP, and then we can have sequels that are based off it that can go on. So we still have the concept of an ongoing fun thing. So like, you know, Age of Empires was a hit. So Age of Empires 2, the obvious next stage was to go to the Middle Ages. Then maybe it wasn't quite as obvious to go on to the Napoleonic times in the New World. <coughs> we had to go somewhere from Age from, you know, Age of Age of Empires, so we went there. And then maybe the next logical step would have been to go to World War II or something, but you know, but you, you get that IP going and it's just like a successful book that goes on forever. You have you always have a job. And that's why they're still doing Zeldas today, right? Excellent. All right, Sandy, I've only got one uh, last question here for you. And this is something I ask every everybody I have on the show, and, and that's uh, what advice do you have, I'm sure you have a lot, uh, for a young person uh, who wants to get into uh, the games industry, or maybe somebody who's older that wants to transition into it. I mean, how can they prepare for that? And then uh, when you're looking at resumes, uh, what really stands out to you? Well, um... Uh, since I taught at the Guildhall at SMU, I think one of my advice would be when I was when I was studying when I was in school, there was no way to learn to be a game. I mean, we didn't even have computer games, right? I mean, it was. I'm not even sure we had Pong. Uh, so there was no way to study the art of game design or game programming or graphics. Uh, now there is. So if you're young, you probably want to prepare to go to some kind of school-based uh, background where you can learn some of that. The Guildhall, I think, is a really good place, but there's others. If you're an older person. Um, well, then it's, it kind of depends on what you want to be. If you want to be an artist, then like, you better know your art. If you want to be a programmer, st study some graphics. If you want to be a designer, you're probably out of luck because um, 
unless you've been really active in the fan community doing like level designs. I mean, I, we get people all the time that come in and they want to be a lead designer. I have this great idea for a game, hire me. And I mean, the problem, the, the thing is that frankly, ideas are a dime a dozen in the game world because uh, I mean, I guess, have you designed any games? Oh, sure, sure. Haven't we all? <laughs> if we took, okay, how about your mom? Has she designed any games? You know, she might have had some variations on Monopoly that I'm not aware of. But I'll bet if we took your mom and stuck her in a room for a month and said, come up with a bunch of really good ideas for games and just, like, study, here's the internet, here's some libraries, and just give her a month to just think about game ideas, she would, by the end of that month, she would probably have six, you know, half a dozen to a dozen decent game ideas. Just like, if that's all you're doing for a month, you can pull it out, right? So ideas are not the problem. The problem is then you have to have a team that does this game idea for a year and a half and is able to pull it off. So it's not the idea, I think, that makes the strong game or game designer. It's the, it's the managing of the team. And that's where people that come in and want to be a designer are missing it because they, they know they have a good idea, but they don't know how to make the team bring it to fruition. So play well with others. Uh, have a strong resume. It's okay to have disasters in your resume because they look for that and say, hey, look, there was a flop. Now, if the flop was your fault, then you need to have like a story as to why you know, it wasn't your fault, right? But we, I look for people that have, uh, that have not been jumping from jobs every six months. I look for people that have a wide range of games they like to play when we interview them. I look for people that have a good, solid um, portfolio. It's harder for a programmer, but, you know, other programmers interview them mostly, so I don't care. But for a designer, I want to see a level he's designed. And I'm looking for something unique or, or funny or clever in it, not just that it was a solid level. Um, so. Yeah, I was wondering, are there telltale signs? And, of, oh, okay, this one's gone. Forget about this person. It's, I, it, I usually tell, there's a lot of people that really early on, I go, oh, this guy. Well, one thing is, if his, if his resume is, like, incoherent and he, like, can't spell, you know, I can't, I said, this guy can't communicate to me what he wants to do. So I'm done. You know, one of the most important things as a designer is you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to get your ideas across so people understand them. And uh, if you can't do it on paper, then uh, you might be able to do it in person, but I will never find out. All right, Sandy. Well, thanks a lot. Is there anything else that you uh, wanted to mention or uh, a website you wanted to point people to? Anything like that? Uh, no, I think I'll just wait for the Kickstarter video in a little bit. Oh, yeah, one other thing I want to mention. One of the things I've done recently is I have been the executive producer on a movie called The Whisperer in Darkness. And uh, it's a full-length movie with sound and everything. Um, it's available, I don't know if it's on uh, Amazon yet or Netflix, but you can IMDb it and look it up. 2000. So there it is. It's, it's based on the story Whisperer in Darkness. It's in black and white. It's filmed as though it was made in 1931, which is when Lovecraft wrote the story. So it looks kind of old-fashioned, but that was sort of part of the fun. So It's by the same guys that did the Call of Cthulhu movie that came out a few years ago, which was silent, actually, because it was back in 27. But this, is, this has sound, it has the aliens, it has, I think, some really good acting. And uh, just, have, just take a look. If you like love, if you like movies, especially old movies, this looks like an old movie. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective. And remember, guys, if there is a game you would like me to review on the show, then you need to submit a 10 to 15 second clip of yourself, introduce yourself, tell me where you're from, and the game you'd like me to look at on the show. I'll put it on the list, and who knows? It could be the next retrospective. So looking forward to seeing those guys. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated, supported, or told somebody about the show really makes a big difference, guys, and I appreciate it very much. If you would like to support the show, you can go to armchairarcade.com. Look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner. Any uh, donation of any size is always uh, valued, as well as telling your friends about me on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. Now, what about that eel of the week? This week, I have a little number called Buffalo Sweat. Uh, this is brewed by the Tall Grass uh, Brewing Company out of Manhattan, Kansas. It's an oatmeal cream stout, uh, fairly low alcohol here, only a 5%. I think that's probably about uh, where a Budweiser is. Uh, 20 IBU, uh, whatever that means. Uh, got a bunch of stats on this can. I have no clue what they're talking about. 
I don't see anything about the, the brew though. Uh, so let's uh, get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this buffalo sweat here in the old drinking horn. I've been smelling this, very chocolatey, kind of like a, a chocolate soldier or a Yoo-Hoo type of smells of this. Nice, uh, quite nice actually. Uh, let's give it a, a taste. Uh, very light. Get kind of a nice, uh, nice taste there. What is that? Sort of a little bit of uh, chocolatey flavor, kind of nutty flavor. Um, not actually very, not a very pungent flavor here. This is very mild uh, tasting. Quite good. I think you could enjoy probably uh, two or three pints of this before it would start to uh, affect you mentally, which I suppose would be a good thing if you are doing a gaming night. Uh, you know, not, not my favorite, but, but definitely not, not a terrible ale. Um, I'd probably go for, if the choice between this and Guinness, uh, that would be a pretty tough call. Uh, but there are plenty of uh, oatmeal cream stouts I would prefer. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, one out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, not a bad choice, uh, but there's lots of better uh, oatmeal cream stouts out there. Uh, so seek those out instead. All right, now what about the quotation? Uh, the quotation from this week, well, <laughs> let me just give you the quotation. I bet you'll know who this is. <laughs> All right. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. See you guys next week. How did it feel to you? Let me think. Don't think. Feel.